Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp, and I'm the Executive Editor for Dataversity. We'd like to th thank you for joining today's Dataversity webinar, Trends in Data Modeling, this year's latest edition in a monthly series called Data and Online with Dr. Peter Aiken, brought to you in partnership with Data Blueprint. We at Dataversity, so <laughs> let me, without further ado, let me give the floor to Megan Jacobs, the webinar organizer from Data Blueprint, to introduce our speakers and today's webinar. And so we can see the presentation again. Perfect. Megan, hello and welcome. Hey, hello. hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Megan Jacobs, and I'm the webinar coordinator here at Data Blueprint. Uh, we're pleased that you found the time to join us for today's webinar on trends in data modeling. As always, a big thank you goes out to Shannon and Dataversity for hosting us. Uh, we'll get started in just a few moments after I let you know about some housekeeping items and introduce your speakers for today. One hour presentation followed by 30 minutes of Q&A. I'll try to answer as many questions as time allows, but feel free to submit questions as they come up throughout the session. Uh, answer the top two most commonly asked questions. Yes, you'll receive an email with links to download today's materials and any other information requests during the session for the next two business days. Uh, you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. We set up the hashtag uh, DataEd on Twitter, so if you're logged on, feel free to use it in your tweets and submit your questions and comments that way. Keep an eye on the Twitter feed, and we'll include answers to those questions on, in our post-session email. Now I'll introduce you to our presenter. Uh, Peter Aiken is an internationally recognized data management thought leader. Many of you already know him or have seen him at conferences worldwide. He has 30 years of experience and has received many awards for his outstanding contributions to the profession. Peter is also the founding director of Data Blueprint. He has written dozens of articles and eight books. The most recent is Monetizing Data Management. Peter, I'll let you introduce our guest speaker for today. Thanks, Megan. So we're pleased to have with me today Stephen McLaughlin. Stephen has a very, very interesting career. He's been the head of marketing and PR for a game development firm. He spent a lot of time in application development, and then like many of us, to the realization that if we could get the data part of the application stuff right, it would be easier. Not easy, but easier. And that's, of course, all we're trying to do is to help people get to easy. Uh, on this. Uh, Stephen, like all of the Data Blueprint Associates, is a certified data management professional. He has a computer science degree from VCU. And he's done a number of different things, including some activities on the outside where he uh, has his own uh, podcast that he has. And we did forget to put the link in there. We'll do right. the, the follow-up on that. But the, tell, tell people what that other podcast is. Just to, yeah, so, so that, that podcast is about the, uh, the broadly appealing topic of historical miniature wargaming. So I'm sure almost everyone out there knows what that is, right? Okay, so nobody knows. Little toy soldiers. That's right. They're basically little toy soldiers, and it's a very niche little industry, and it's a lot of fun. Um, I have a series of websites that deals with that, mostly historical games, but other things like board games and some of the newer stuff you guys might be familiar with as uh, board gaming becomes kind of a newer trend. So pretty interesting. Very cool stuff. So uh, again, well-rounded individuals we have here. That's one way to put it. <laughs> so Stephen, terrific to have you with us today. We're going to talk about trends in data modeling. And what we wanted to do was to, to bring all of you into sort of what we're seeing in the marketplace. So while there's a lot of talk at various events and things, Stephen is on the front lines of seeing how this stuff is implemented uh, on this. Now just to, to start out for everybody's uh, background here, we collectively believe here at Data Blueprint, and I think Data Diversity can include it in that group as well, that data is the most powerful yet underutilized and poorly managed organizational data asset. Assets are resources that need to be controlled by the organization because we're going to have some benefit in the future. Uh, very, very simple proposition, but harder for a lot of people to actually put their finger on, on it. Data really is your sole non-depletable, non rating durable strategic asset. And when you compare and contrast it with other types of assets that we have, some people say it's the new oil, some people have cited it down as the new soil because you can plant things in it and they grow, or we've even got one group that says it's the new bacon. Okay. I would take that a step further and say it's the new bacon mayonnaise. Bacon mayonnaise. There we go. All right. <laughs> <laughs> like those bison burgers we were eating the other day. Okay. <laughs> when you compare that to data assets, to financial assets, real estate assets, and inventory assets, we manage those assets in a very different manner in which most organizations manage their data. So our goal here is to help you all unlock 
specific business value in your organizations by strengthening your data management capabilities, by providing tailored solutions to your specific business problems that you're having, and building lasting partnerships with you overall. So let's dive into the presentation, Stephen. We'll talk about today. Okay. So uh, you'll, you'll notice there's a bit of a focus on NoSQL kind of towards the middle there. I think that's just some emerging trends that I think might be kind of interesting. Uh, a bit of high-level approach to it today. I'm not going to get too far under the hood, but that'll be kind of interesting to sort of approach those from a broad spectrum. But starting from the beginning, we're going to go back over what really a data model is. Uh, we hope that most of you joining us are already familiar with those concepts, but just in case, we're going to walk through what a conceptual and a logical and a physical data model is. And specifically, we're going to tie that in by uh, addressing what issues poor data modeling can uh, can introduce. Uh, and, and you all, hope you all are all familiar that there are a uh, myriad of issues that that can introduce. Uh, we're going to go into different models, different uses. Uh, the focus is really going to be the right tool for the right job as opposed to one model to rule them all. So we'll talk about, uh, again, like I said, some of the, the NoSQL um, uh, no architectures that are sort of coming to the forefront now. Uh, and then we're going to tie it off by talking about kind of how it's changing. Uh, we're going to discuss patterns and use, uh, this growing abstraction for application and data sharing. Uh, we call that data sharing the world, right? These APIs that are going to just make data available to everyone and anyone who wants it. And then we're going to end with scale out, not up, and a few uh, thoughts about things like sharding, and make sure shard yourself. Right. <laughs> we knew that was coming. We knew, yeah, I, I warned you guys. <laughs> Great. Well, let's dive in and, and what is a data model as far as that goes? Right. Okay. So uh, a data model, as you all are familiar with, it basically organizes your data into elements and standardizes how the other data elements relate to one another. Pretty straightforward. You guys have seen them probably, uh, you know, all throughout your your daily life. Uh, in Data Modeling Made Simple by Steve Hoberman, he said, a data model is a wayfinding tool for both business and IT professionals, which uses a set of symbols and text to precisely explain a set of real information to improve communication within the organization, and thereby lead to a more flexible and stable application environment. That's a dirty, but I really think that's a pretty exhaustive explanation right there. Another way to think of it, too, is, and, and Steve concentrates on this on his definition, which again is what you do in the practice, which is the idea that we really all need to be on literally the same sheet of paper. Right. And one of the other things you don't know about Stephen is that he's also a musician and has uh, had a band uh, in the past and did uh, well over a thousand shows out of the back of a van and <laughs> lived that way. Which isn't as glamorous as it sounds. <laughs> but, but as a musician, you can appreciate that the fact that we need to be on the same sheet of paper. Absolutely. And it's a common language we need to speak, right? Precisely. And that's exactly what we're trying to do with the models here, is to provide that same kind of commonality in there. Right. I was going to talk about uh, how data models are expressed as architectures. Uh, apparently, I think well, you know, the main idea about them is that these attributes of these entities are organized into entities and objects, and that's graphically represented typically. Uh -oh. I lost my screen for a second. Uh, it entitles, oh, I'm sorry, that says entities, doesn't it? Entities, objects, are things whose information is managed in simple strategy. Uh, let's look at the next one so we can show a couple of examples. Yeah, and Keith, there are a bunch of examples of entities organized into uh, objects here, but uh, and, and attributes organized into entities. We'll get to architecture, though, which is a little bit harder to show the examples. That's the reason. I'm glad I read that type on a pretty <laughs> level. Uh, combinations of attributes and entities are structured to represent information requirements. That's pretty straightforward, right? You're thinking of a customer. You're thinking of an address. Right? You're thinking of a, a, a shipment or a product. And, and poorly structured data constrains organizational information delivery capabilities, right? And that's uh, that's. I think if, if you have poorly defined customers and you're trying to ask questions about your customers, that's going to add all kinds of complication on top of that, as I'm sure most of you are, have come to be familiar with. And many of you have heard me make this analogy as well. One of the things we absolutely try to get the clients that we're working with to do is to not label things at the wrong level of abstraction. For example, customer is almost always the wrong level of abstraction. A very simple example is, if you're talking about customers and you say mail a coupon to our customers and their customers are current customers and you're telling them the thing they bought yesterday is now cheaper as a result of this coupon, you have a very bad taste in their mouth. Also, we, we, we almost always need to take our customers and divide them up into different subtypes. Uh, again, customers versus uh, potential customers is one way to think about it. I think you'll see a 
a common theme uh, about what Peter's talking about here, and that a lot of thought needs to go in at the front end if you really want to get the most you can on the back end, I think. Look at that going from more granular to more abstract, and finally, the last part of it. That's right. So the, the models are organized into broader architectures. And so when building new systems, architectures are used to plan development. And more often, data managers do not know uh, what existing architectures are, and therefore, they can't make use of them in support of strategy implementation. And you see that all over the place. You see siloed systems coming up, not even realizing that the next building, the next office, maybe the next cubicle over is already doing something. Thing that they trying to do as well. Now, the reason we don't have examples at this level is because architecture is a much broader topic and it mm -hmm. takes a lot longer to walk through these. So once again, you all in our audience have your own examples of architectures and if you can practice that process of explaining to people how useful, not useful, that particular architecture is. Mm -hmm. And that gets to another component, which is something that we, we also like to practice for everybody, which is to say that don't put a model together unless you have a purpose statement for that model. Right. We're in this model in order to achieve X, Y, and Z, whatever X, Y, and Z are. And if not, it just becomes an exercise in, in nice practice, but probably not business value. And of course, that's where we really want to concentrate. That's absolutely right. So I'm going to review a little bit of some basic knowledge for some of you, but this may be uh, new information for a couple of you listeners out there. Uh, the idea of the conceptual data model, and we've, we've mentioned earlier, there's basically three levels. There's the conceptual, the logical, and the physical. Uh, the conceptual data model really represents entities and relationships. It should identify the domain and scope of data. This is exactly what Peter was just talking about. Um, at this level, it really should be easily understood by business users in order to communicate core data concepts and drive application requirements. Right? That's exactly what Peter's talking about with, with music. Right? You, everyone's looking at the same beat without going too far into to the theory behind what makes that music enjoyable. Uh, this is a very high level. You're saying this is a customer and he lives at this address, uh, just like in our example there. Right. And what, what isn't necessarily flushed out at this level, although it can be, is, uh, for example, a customer may have many addresses or many customers may share one address, right? That's pretty straightforward. That will absolutely be represented at the local level and it's a bit optional to be represented at the conceptual level. I would argue that it should be. But. Let's look at a, a specific example around this. Here's an example from the veterans hospital system that we were working on in the early 90s. Now, this is an example of how data modeling was done in the past. Uh, and one of the reasons we're doing this particular webinar is because we wanted to bring you guys sort of up to date with some more modern techniques. But this is a very good traditional use of the data model. And you'll notice that I've circled the relationship between admission and discharge. So we have a question that has occurred about that at one point in time. And we can look and see that the admission associated with one and only one discharge. We can also then look by the data model and see if we can see what the difference is between an admission, in this case, and an actual discharge. So when you look at these two here, and the circles are slightly off on, on your screen there, but we can look at the precise definition. Now, one of the things that this gives us is the understanding that every admission must have a discharge. So therefore, one of the things we brought to the attention of the group we were working with at the time was clearly one of the things in terms of being discharged for was being dead. I know that's not a very happy subject to talk about, but if that's the type of thing we're doing, we're saying we have to be comprehensive about it, and clearly you leave the hospital, you're either alive or not. Right. So again, the model here allowed us to circle in on that particular topic and allow people to see how that actually worked. We can take it a step further, diving deeper down into the process, and look specifically around a particular entity. So you'll see this entity called bed had four attributes, bed.description, bed.status, bed.sex to be assigned, and bed reservation reason. Notice also below it, it has an association with a concept called a room. A room can have zero, one, or more beds in the room. Now, there's another area where we just discovered that there was a little problem with the way in which the system was being specified originally. Uh, one of the things that was going on in the early 90s was that people were discovering this new technology called RFID. And RFID, while it was really neat, they thought that this would help of losing people in hospitals. I don't want to scare you guys, but it does happen occasionally where somebody will get lost in a hospital. I pointed out to them that if a bed could contain zero or, excuse me, a room could contain zero or more beds, 
then and we were going to use the RFID to track where the bed was in which room and what else had to be a room. And it turned out, oh, that meant a hallway had to be a room. Or an elevator. And an elevator. Exactly right. And of course, that was what really blew their mind because they couldn't figure out every room had to be on the floor. That's right. Unless elevator, in which case it didn't work. So not that this is bad or good, but it caused some questions to be asked. And it's right. to ask the questions when you're at the conceptual stage, as opposed to I've already built it, now I have to go back and do what I did and get back into it the other way. So that's conceptual modeling at a high level. Now we're going to move to logical modeling. That's right. And so the logical model is really just sort of the next level down. Right. Uh, we're now going to represent the conceptual data model, and it should be very close to the conceptual data model, but we're going to be a bit more thorough. Um, in this case, we're going to include attributes. We're going to include names of entities uh, more clearly. Uh, we're going to explicitly um, identify the relationships and, and any other metadata that we might want to put around this. Uh, this rule right here, I think, is what most business users will still understand, and certainly all IT workers should understand. So this, this is really your common ground here, in my opinion. Um, this will be developed using uh, a data modeling notation, for example, UML is typically go to, although I've seen lots of other things from scrolling on napkins and so forth, which is not the best practice. Um, so in this case, you now see that customer has an address. Um, not written there is the inverse relationship of that, is that address could have many customers. So this is an any to many relationship between the two. Uh, you can certainly think of plenty of real world examples for that. Um, but we've now gone beyond what a customer is by explaining exactly what attributes make up a customer. Um, clearly, this is not exhaustive, being just an example, but in this case, for this business purpose, we've identified a customer as having a customer number, it's probably their key, possibly a surrogate ID, uh, going to have a social security number, their first name, their last name, their salutation, and a phone number. All right now, I should argue the phone number should possibly be pulled there, but that might be over-normalizing. And then the address is going to have a street, city, state, zip, country, pretty straightforward. But those are the things that identify that entity and how the two relate to each other. And that is not have anything about the customer's dog in that particular right. place, which is an explicit business decision at this point to say that we're not going to talk about dogs. Not that we have anything against dogs. It's just not part of the business problem at this point. So to include, and by definition, then what you exclude also. At the conceptual level, we weren't looking at that specificity. Now we are. Right. And without going too far down that rabbit hole, right, how much redundancy do we see out there? How much data should have been excluded in the first place? But we don't need to go down that right now. Well, but it, it is interesting in the sense that Lewis and I argue about this all the time. I, mean, I think that about 80% of the corporate data out there falls into the category of redundant obsolete or trivial, he thinks it's closer to 95%. Yeah. So either way, the, the, the two answers are not good. Right. So conceptual, logical, of course, everybody knows the next step is physical. That's right. And in the physical data model, we're going to describe the specific database implementation of the data. I've seen physical data models really vary pretty wildly uh, between organizations and even a couple of different uh, standards organizations think have sort of different definitions. I'm going with the fairly middle of the road idea that it really is describing within the specific technology you're using. So something like Oracle or, or SQL, you're going to be using that notation. Um, consequently, the attributes will now be named according to either your business or your technology naming conventions. Uh, you're going to see your data types. You're going to have accurate table names. You're going to have the information. Your relationships are going to be built out further into the, the structure that actually going to be represented as physically. And so you see the slight variations here between this and the, uh, the logical. So we now see the naming conventions, so the keys, uh, and so on and so forth. Yeah, one, one higher level that communicates more to the businesses, whereas this is clearly more of a technical focused uh, piece on here. And before we move on, let me, let me bring everybody up to date with one piece that has happened here. Stephen mentioned in the last slide, UML. Uh, in the data modeling community, there used to be a bit of tension around people that used UML because uh, uh, you had some challenges originally where it was uh, uh, not really representing the full robustness of what we do in data modeling. And the uh, people at OMG read out to DEMA and put together a group. Uh, David Hay was instrumental in, in working that particular piece. We now do have an improvement in UML that allows us to do robust data modeling in there. So that's the first thing. It used to be 20 years ago, people would go, oh, I'm not going to go into UML because I've got to get really hairy with my normalization. And if I do that, 
I'm not going to be able to, to do it in UML. The answer is now we, in fact, can do this. That's right. Um, so now we mentioned earlier, we're going to just talk a bit about some of the consequences of poor data modeling, and they can be quite vast, actually. Uh, you're seeing some uh, of issues around that. Um, right off the bat, poor data modeling up front can cause data quality issues downstream. We all probably realize that. Uh, if the model isn't a true representation of the business concepts, it's going to impact confidence in the data. And we see that quite a bit, right? If, if a worker says, I don't trust that data, well, then that data is as good as useless to them, right? Uh, the potential for four database uh, application performance for reads and writes. So, you know, you can normalize, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but if it's taking ages for your beautiful data model to do what it needs to do, right? If you're trying to do an application and it takes you five minutes to bring one customer, well then you probably rethink your data model or your technology and your architecture for it. Typically, it's a good place to start with looking at the data model. Yeah, we, we get the question oftentimes, can you come help tune the Oracle system and we'll, we'll figure out that it's not the Oracle system that's the problem, it's the stuff you're putting in the Oracle system. That's right. Yep. I just gave a good example of that. Right. And I think this is a big one uh, we run into is this lack of flexibility in your model can cause difficulty aligning with evolving business requirements. And, and what that means is you constrain yourself within the data model. You didn't think of the future being flexible. And so uh, what happens is you wind up overload fields. I mean, how many times have we seen an email field in something like, uh, I, I don't know, a date of birth field or just something where it really doesn't belong? And, and that causes problems for people who that hasn't been communicated to. I can stuff that in that field without asking IT to fill me out a bunch of right. forms and triplicates and all of those things. And of course, that's where you end up with real, real big problems. Okay, really quickly, just because it's fresh in our minds, I'm going to respond to one of the questions. Is there anything what's the consensus on reference tables? And I, I absolutely agree with that, uh, right? The state as a free type field without a reference table absolutely does not make sense. And I, I, I I'm a big fan of those tables, and especially nowadays that there's so many data services out there, you can actually get USPS um, information for addresses and make sure they're validated. So just to answer that question quickly, yeah, I think that example uh, certainly is something we could really scrutinize over and over because, again, I think that uh, state should be separate. Really, nowadays, I think address should be a validated field. So to answer that in the middle, but I thought that was pertinent right here. Yeah, absolutely. And then, again, what are we going to do when we add the 51st, 52nd, 53rd states That's to this? exactly the, right. Yep. Everybody go back and reprogram that? I think not. That was a good question. Uh, difficulty integrating data in the future. I'll be honest with you, this is probably the biggest issue we face day in and day out. Is integrating data. I think it's a little bit of a recursive problem, right? What happens is uh, someone doesn't trust the data, so then they build their own system that's separate, that meets their own needs. They don't trust the other data, and then that happens again in the next office building, or that happens again in the next line of business. And then some executive says, "Hey, I want to put these things together." And when someone says, "Ooh, you know what? Not real sure how to do that." Are you going to call? <laughs> so, so that's that's a big deal, and, and that's uh, you know especially nowadays as we're moving towards. Obviously, we very much believe that uh, not having a grasp on your data is going to to be a major uh, impact in your future. So, you know, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's one out there. Right, we've kind of talked about that already. It constrains your business agility. I guess I won't really revisit that. I think you guys understand that it's basically tying you to a model if you're not careful early on. And, and again, if, if it's the model that wasn't really well thought out, then you're left with nothing but workarounds in the future. That's right. That's right. the real problem with most software packages is that they tend to have their data models not as well thought out as a data modeler might do it. That's right. And speaking as a developer, I've never, ever, ever done a workaround, right? Okay. Fingers crossed on that one, guys. Right. <laughs> um, and again, it can create operational inefficiencies. I think that's more just feeding into what we've been saying. Now, this is an important one, too, right? It does limit workflow transparency. It can be difficult to tie everything together uh, when you have multiple um, uh, systems or multiple silos because you had to uh, expand that way. Uh, so I, I think that's a pretty good one. Do you have any thoughts on that? Because I know that's something we've run into time and time again. The, the real key there, and I, I heard silos described differently at a conference last week. Right. They're considered to be cylinders of excellence. Oh, that's beautiful. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but you're right in the 
sense of tying them together. We've got a lot of, of different parts, and probably many of your organizations have the same situation, where you have data in separate places, and somebody sort of has chocolate and somebody else has peanut butter. Mm -hmm. Unless they happen to round the corner and bump into each other while they're both holding a pile of fudge and a pile of peanut butter, right. they never really know that that was the case. Right. So unless you engender situations, try to have regular meetings. This is a part of data governance, a different webinar topic. We did that one actually last month. But unless you have a mechanism for saying, come to the table and share what data you have with other people, it becomes very, very difficult to, to understand these things. And then people find out by happenstance. And we'd rather have them find that program. That's out. exactly right. Yep. Uh, I think this kind of supports what we're saying. Right? It's, we just know that it's impacting actual business processes. It's impacting your insights. If you can't get a full view of your customers, that's a problem. Like everyone wants to jump to this new trend. They want to have big data. I want to have predictive analytics. Well, guess what? You can't get to this. You can't answer simple questions like who are my customers. That sounds dead simple, doesn't it? To say I'm a, I'm I'm an executive here, and I want to say you know hi. How many customers do we have? That's not an easy question to answer when customers are spread across three different silos and they have different definitions and different systems. Or, you know, this person hasn't bought anything from me in 24 months. Are they still a customer? Uh, and I'm getting a bit into business rules here, but I, I think it's, uh, it's very pertinent for the data model. I think an example of, of one of the things that happened on one of the projects that Lewis and I were on uh, many, many moons ago. Right. Uh, we were implementing a data model model was going to go into production, and we discovered an error in the data model. Okay. And we, we told everybody, you know, sorry, uh, we just discovered this. It was a late addition, a late requirement. When we incorporated the requirement, we could tell that the data model that we're about to field is inadequate. Right. Management said, that doesn't matter. It's going to go out Monday no matter what. Mm -hmm. And we were able to add up the amount of overtime that it took the staff of 300 programmers over the next six weeks to go back and do it. And management came back and said, well, we should have listen to you guys because clearly we know exactly how much overtime we just paid over the last six weeks and it would have been a lot cheaper than delaying the project by a couple of days mm -hmm. to get that particular piece of it right. That's exactly right. Yeah. So let's uh, move on a little bit. Okay. We're diving a little bit now into normalization. And right. I'll let you take this one away. Yeah, we're not, we're not going to repeat for all of the wonderful data models that are out there uh, what the normalization processes. I, I will say though that as data modeler it's not the conversation we want to have with executives per se, um, but it is important to be able to explain the business consequences of not normalizing. And because it's taught so happily in most um, educational circumstances, even good, smart IT people didn't necessarily get a good education in, in that. If it happens, it makes it harder for everybody to have this kind of an understanding here. So the, the basics are really what we're trying to do is set up the situation here where we would love to have the vast majority of data models analyzed at third normal form. That's right. And this is the part that most people don't around to understanding and normalized, of course, for production constraints. And you alluded to that earlier, Stephen. That's right. So what we could teach in college and university here is a model that looks kind of like this. I use CM2 because I use a, that abbreviation as common metadata modeling. Uh, on there, which is really what we're talking about in terms of everything. If we start at the lower left-hand corner, we have our physical as-is. We then taught to move to logical as-is. And if we're not going to change the requirements, we can move to the logical 2B. That's quadrant 3 up here uh, on there. And then finally, the physical as-is model. Now, we as data modelers, most applications people do not understand the need for that, and they go strictly from technology-dependent physical to technology dependent physical. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. And if we can't explain the reasons why that doesn't work in in terms that mean things to executives, which means you're usually explaining it in terms of dollars or bodies one way or the other, uh, it is going to be a problem for us. But a little bit more interesting too, even if we do understand this model, let me take that same model and do slightly differently with the whole thing. So again, we start out here and this little green blob that you're seeing on your screen now goes from your physical as is to your logical as is, your logical as is to your logical B, and your logical uh, sorry, as a 2B, right? And then you get to your typical 2B. All right, you get that. That's the way we tend to teach it. But what's really happening here, we're not doing this unless there's a change. If somebody said, I need to have some sort of a change. So go up to this logical as is situation, something else happens here. 
we have other logical as-is data architectural components, other models that are out there that need to be integrated. And you mentioned before and how difficult it was to integrate things if you didn't have transparency into it. Profiling can help give you some insight into those ideas, so profiling is a tremendous adjunct for the models. But look here, I've got some green and some orange requirements. So what we really need to do is to take that logical as-is model and transform it to where it incorporates these new capabilities. So I've done something clever here with uh, PowerPoint and just sort of made it look like it's green and orange in that because they take that new revised model, move it over to our logical to be, and then drop it into the implementation context. And if we if we away from this a little bit, we can actually look and see that anything we do in a model transformation is going to be constrained within this particular framework here. Again, as is and to be, and at the bottom, conceptual, logical, physical. I do one more thing in this as well, and that's that I validate the models as we're going through. And that's the process of asking the users to try to prove us wrong. Remember, of course, if you ask them, how is it, and they say, fine, no information is transferring under those circumstances. But if I say, what's wrong with this model, everybody loves to be a critic and they can dive into this. So, so this space here that I'm showing on the screen really conceptually represents the world in which we operate uh, in there. So let's go back in and look at, at Third Normal Forum and specifically talk about where things are uh, within that context. That's right. So we'll start with, I think, what, what people touched on is kind of what you all are probably familiar with seeing in the wild. It's certainly probably 90% of what we deal with uh, is your standard Third Normal Forum or relational system where each attribute in the relationship is affected about a key, and this is uh, just like the examples we're showing earlier. This is a highly normalized structure. This is the structure that for many people out there, just because it's been around for ages, makes the most sense. It meshes in your head, right? Sometimes I find after I've done some intense data modeling, I start to see everything in my life in third normal form, you know? I'm sure you guys have done that before, right? No? Megan, take it. So, uh, I'm sure they're making more. <laughs> Some typical use cases, right? Transactional systems, operational data stores, lots and lots of applications out there in third normal form. Uh, just given a quick example here of a record label, and again, I think you'll even see some of the questions in the Q&A. This is certainly not even fully normalized. Again, we're seeing address information, right, at the same record as the re or the same uh, table as the record label, and in fact, what if a record label has multiple addresses? So it's not a perfect model, but I think you guys get the idea as a sample. And when we talk about third normal form here, Steve, what you're really talking about is a class of modeling to do problem solving. So That's right. normal form is a way of fully understanding the model at its most flexible, most adaptable situation. If we go back to the slide a couple previous to this, you saw I had fourth and fifth normal forms up there. They have some additional capabilities that will allow us to draw out specific business rules. But if you get to third normal form, that's generally a good place to look, to stop, take a pause, and see if there's are of the model we need to go further with it that's or right. not. So from a, a traditional perspectives where most people are taught, mm -hmm. tool set that they know how to use, and it's a good solution for many types of problems. That's right. And I think if you hit the next slide there, we do have some pros and cons. So uh, as a pro, it's easily understood business and end users. Again, this is where you're going to find most of the expertise out there today around. Um, uh, there's reduced data redundancy. That's handy, particularly to take up, uh, typically, theoretically, it takes up less space on the disk. You've got nice Enforced referential integrity. So if you're doing things like uh, someone mentioned Q and A, you have your lookup tables, your reference tables, um, and uh, the index attributes and flexible querying. Really that should be at the top, in my opinion. I think the biggest strength of this uh, is the technologies that support this really provide for some very rich querying. I mean, you you can take a, a relational system and ask a lot of questions about your data and get a lot of ad hoc answers. Um, so uh, moving on to some of the cons. Joins can get quite expensive. We mentioned that earlier. Um, you know, we have an example here. Neo4j have that as, a, as, as an example on their website. They call it the join bomb, and you can just see how ugly that is. Uh, and consequently, it doesn't scale well. So if it's a user, single tenant application, it's probably going to be fine. But if you're talking something like Facebook, right, something huge, then uh, it, it's probably not going to do the job. It's going to choke. So when we're talking about the, the modeling at the third, normal form. One of the things, again, that's important to do is to make people understand you have to have some time in order to do this. You 
can't just put the model out there going from your logical model to this, but you really do to analyze it. And again, if you've got a business example, at least in this company that Lewis and I worked for, uh, that I gave you the example a few minutes ago of having the, the raw model, they, got it. they understood that six weeks of overtime and everybody working on the weekends was really a bad outcome for the organization to correct a problem that was easily definable. In fact, we had to find it up front uh, in order to do this. And it's a little hard because when you start talking about third-level form, you train up with more boxes on your chart. And it looks like more data. And you've got to be really, really clear to make sure that people understand just because more boxes doesn't mean you have more data. The boxes represent a class of items, and we're breaking it down to a different level of granularity. That gives us the ability to end up with over less data. Again, each table that we have out there in the system should represent one fact and one fact only That's right. uh, in there. Consequently, there's not a lot of redundancy, which, which there's plenty of pros for this, absolutely. However, seeing, you know, as businesses evolve and as the web continues to grow, we are seeing that it's not necessarily meeting every business need like maybe it used to be able to do, to come close anyway. Or, that's right. So go ahead and move on to the next one that is probably what something else you guys are familiar with. Maybe not everybody, but certainly most anyone working in uh, BI or doing any kind of analytics. Is the concept of a star schema. Right? This is comprised of fact tables, they are centralized fact tables, and there's a quantitative data and then any number of adjoining dimension tables. So those dimensions are you know, rapidly changing or they can be sliced and diced on when you're doing analytics. Uh, and as I mentioned, star schema is absolutely optimized for business reporting. So a use cases, right? online analytic processing, business intelligence, piecing you want to add to this one? It's really just people, when they look at star schemas, we, we try to speak to them about n-dimensional problems. Mm -hmm. You're showing a three-dimensional problem here in many instances. It's 12 dimensions that are required. Right. But then you also, as you start to add that complexity onto this, now you get back into your joint bomb. Again, I like that particular yeah, that's good. Huh? We'll have to write a song about that that's one. Right. So <laughs> we have something in it. But, but this to the important part of it. If you let the user specify by what they want, they'll give you, wow, you know, I'd, I'd like to have one of these and one of these and one of these and one of these. Mm -hmm. You've had to deal with these requests before. You, the answer is yes, we can build it, right? but it will cost you something. And so, again, if you're going to have a billion joins that are going out there, and by the way, star schemas tend to avoid a lot of these things. Right. Um, so what you're trying to do is pre-structure and anticipate what the queries are going to be, but you cannot prioritize them. So that while somebody may say, oh, I've got to have all these dimensions, if you actually build the model, watch it for 12 weeks and discover that they're only using a little bit of the functionality, that's right. then you can relax some of those constraints in, in your prototyping uh, that's right. mode. And that's exactly why you think data marts kind of come, right? These are marts that are specific built to answer specific questions. So, so if we go to the next page, we'll talk about some of the pros and cons there. Uh, the pro is it's a fairly simple design. Now, I, I should have put an asterisk on that. I do find that sometimes people have a little trouble wrapping their head around a star schema, but typically it's, it's fairly understood. Uh, very fast queries. Most major uh, database management systems are optimized for star schema design. So you are seeing that, uh, um, a lot of support out of the box for a lot of uh, DBMSs that people already have in place. So uh, a well-established pattern that people are familiar with. This also is very helpful. You throw something at somebody, and it's going to take them a little bit of time to become comfortable with. That's it. absolutely right. But some of the cons is questions must be built in design, and you know, again, I wanted to put a star on this. You also see that as a pro if you really want to um, contain and, and know exactly what your data is being used for. But it, it's a little bit of lack of, lack of flexibility. Uh, the questions are by design built in. Um, data marts are often centralized on one fact table. And again, that's kind of a weak con, but it fails, right? right. So that's it. That's right. If you want unit, right. that's a very different structure. Exactly right. And so it, it can come up some integration issues, although you, you could just build another star schema for that. But again, it's you know, a little bit of a lack of flexibility, very specific um, problems that these are solving. So those are the first two. What is the need for the third method coming up? That's about? right. So this is one we're actually pretty fond of this here at Data Blueprint. Again, the, the entire team is certified in data Vault methodology. So. That's right. Um, and so the data vault is really designed to facilitate long-term historical storage, focusing on ease of implementation. And we'll talk a little more about that. But the idea is these can basically be rapidly stood up because they don't really care if the data structure changes much. And, and I'll explain that in a second. Um, they retain data lineage information. That sounds like Nirvana right there. Yeah, <laughs> I know. It, it's not all 
it's not all bread and or milk and honey, but it's you know, it's pretty good. Uh, the concept behind it is this: all data, all the time. And it's a bit of a hybrid approach of Inman and Kimball. I believe Dan Lynch that sometimes, maybe jokingly or not so jokingly, refers to it as third and a half normal form. So it's a little bit differently normalized. Uh, and, and here's kind of the basics of it. And again, we're only kind of touching on the surface of this. So if this is something new for you guys, please don't hesitate to reach out to me or Bull or whatever. Yeah, we, we can put another yeah. webinar together on That's this right. topic. Because data vault's pretty interesting. But the main concept is it's comprised of these hooks. Hubs contain a list of business keys that do not change very often. So see in this example of a customer, right, an order. These are your hubs. Then you have your links, which are associations between the hubs. You're seeing right there the customer, and he, the customer has an order. So that's what's relating to them. And then you're seeing satellites. And those satellites are the descriptive attributes associated with hubs and links. And those satellites are interesting because they can basically change as much as you want because they're always reading back to a hub, they can add new fields, they can add new, uh, they, they can remove fields, add new ones, and you're always going to have them. Answer this question really quickly because I did say it, uh, uh, to how we can, you can reach out to us. Uh, you can reach me on Twitter at SJ McLaughlin. My name's hard to spell, but you can find it at the beginning of the, uh, of the presentation. You can reach by email at S McLaughlin, no J in that one, at datablueprint.com. So I'm detailing that a bit there, but should mail us. For that. We can fix yeah, that's uh, no. I'm not gonna make an alias for my beautiful last name. Perfectly <laughs> long. Uh, so I have some pros and cons to the data vault. I got honest, it was a little hard for me to find the cons just because I'm really smitten by data vault. But you know, in fairness here, uh, it's got simple integration because of this all the data all the time approach. Uh, it, it's really quite simple to integrate. Uh, it has immense amount of data with excellent performance. Um, that put under the hood, right, a little bit inside baseball. Uh, and, and it's got your full data lineage, which can be really important for auditability, things like that. On um, is because it's so simple to integrate, the application is really pushed to the back end. So it is going to require some ETL work to really get what you want back out of it, I think. Um, it can be difficult to set up for many data workers, right? There's just a lot of expertise around there. And I think that's going to be a con that holds true through the rest of these examples, because we're going to talk at a high level about some notes. SQL solutions, and there's not a lot of widespread support for ETL tools. That's really kind of changing now. I think we're seeing uh, newer and newer ETL tools are supporting this out of the box, but I, I, I think that was worth mentioning at least. One of the things I like to think about as a use case for data vaults is an organization where they're set with a series of regulatory requirements. Mm -hmm. Regulations change. You don't want to go back and normalize the data warehouse to come up to speed with regulations. So what you can essentially do is freeze time at certain That's places. right. And you don't have to go back, but you could still pair apples to apples That's within, right. the, within the modeling uh, method along those lines. So let's, as we get into NoSQL, talk a little bit about some of the things that are hypeful around it. And uh, again, one of the things I like to introduce to groups is if they've not seen it, Gartner's five-phase hype cycle methodology starts off in the lower left-hand corner there with a the little green ball of the technology trigger. Cool! Somebody says, you know, some of the data is more important than other data, right? So we get this great idea, and of course that gets us up to the peak of inflated expectations, where the hype outrises the, uh, the actual business value, which means the next thing that's going to happen after lunch is to drop into the trial of disillusionment. Uh, oh, it sucks, right? Well, it's neither really good and it also doesn't suck because we really need to find out where it is. We do that by climbing the slope of enlightenment and eventually landing ourselves on the plateau of productivity. Right. So again, a, a nice little description. And I just wanted to show you that because you have to see where big data falls into that category. Now, this is as of a couple of years back, but it's still fairly relevant. Text analytics, for example, has where to go but up. If you're doing the analytics, that's a great place to be in because the future has already been through that, wow, it's going to solve everything or it really sucks. Now we're getting back to what it really can do. Uh, similarly, if you're in social network analysis, the implication here is you to go through a rough ride. Uh, on the other hand, predictive analytics and web analytics have been well done, so those pieces are relatively mature in terms of it. Now, now that you've watched that, one of the things also to keep in mind here is that Gardner reminds everybody that the focus in on these big data techniques is not a substitute for the fundamentals of information management. I love that they included that. Yeah, that was there. Uh, similarly, then, if we look at July of 2012 and what's going on in 
important here. We can see that big data was two to five years away from peak hype as of July 2012. Interestingly, just 12 months later, July of 2013, big data is now five to ten years away from big, uh, peak hype. But this is not to say that this stuff doesn't work. There are plenty of companies that are achieving very good business value by incorporating big data technologies into their architectural platforms. But how you're going to do that and how you're going to cut through the cycle that is there is something that you all are the best people who are able to come up with that. You your business, you know these techniques, you can look at this and say, that tool will solve this problem and that tool will solve that particular problem. So let's give a specific example on this. And, and I just quickly want to introduce NoSQL. If any of you out there are unfamiliar with it, I do encourage you to, to, to take away from this a, a desire to read more about it. And there's a great opportunity that actually uh, Data Ed does. Uh, there was the NoSQL Now conference uh, out in San Jose. I got the opportunity to attend, and it was really quite interesting to see how this technology is maturing. Now, if some of you have heard the name NoSQL and thought, what does that really mean? It's a bit of a misnomer. Uh, it's kind of been backwards uh, change to say not only SQL, but a lot of these do now support the query language, and in fact, it's, it's kind of a catch-all term for a lot of fairly different yet similar uh, technologies that all kind of share something different. I, they're almost non-relational, although that's even a bit of a misnomer. It's, it's really it's a bit of a muddy water to navigate, and again, feel free to reach out to me if you're interested, or, or Google is certainly your friend on this. But so we can tell you a very technical definition, but kind of blobbish, right? In cases, I would say so, yeah. Yeah. Great definition here. Okay. So uh, we're going to talk about document and key value here. And, and while they are different, they're similar enough to where I thought it was worth uh, explaining. So kind of the, the key concept between both of these are that they're scalable uh, thanks to a distributed hash table. And what that really means is with no SQL system, because you've got your data stored in all these different tables, it's very difficult to get clustering. Now, I should add a quick caveat here. Almost every single technology vendor is working to address these cons. So I say this, and I'm, I'm very, very much in theory. And it's probably changed by the end of the webinar. Exactly right. So many SQL providers are attempting to account for these cons. And, and some cons you'll see me mention here, there are specific technologies that work to address those. I'm talking very conceptually here. The idea is that it can be distributed nicely, right, especially for something like web scale, massive, you know, multi-user. Uh, multi thousands of users uh, applications, something like Facebook, you can have that housed uh, all across different um, uh, servers, different geographical locations, uh, whatever you may need. Um, now, the other kind of key feature is it's a flexible, largely schema list design. Uh, list, again, a bit of a misnomer. We're, we're really meaning that the schema is really handled by your application logic. Uh, they don't say have have to rigidly adhere to something you've defined. And so see this example on the left there. That's really what a document like, might look like. That's a JSON. Uh, I've also heard it pronounced JSON. I'm not sure what's correct. Mm. That's a JSON document that basically will have a key and this blob of document information. And it looks a, a lot like something uh, like XML, if you're unfamiliar with seeing JSON. Uh, and you basically have all of these attributes are actually grouped together now. So you might see Peter, right? Right? He might have his address as part of his own document, and it's a very denormalized structure. And what that means is very rapid access, and it allows us to store them in different locations because of that distributed hash table. Um, and so you're seeing the, the document concept on the left, and on the right we have a key value where it might be something much smaller than a document. I, I really think they're very similar uh, in concept. But typically, a key value pair might have something uh, much smaller as the value. Uh, it's basically just a two-column table, right? Uh, your key could have something like username underscore first name, username underscore last name. So that could create a key for us. We might have Peter Aiken first name, and that'll bring up Peter, and then Peter Aiken last name Peter, right? So or, uh, Aiken. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, okay, so I hope that makes sense. I realize that for some of you, this may be very new information, and there's a lot out there, and we have a bit to cover, so I'm going to move on from this. But uh, uh, quickly, the use cases, as we did talk about, applications with many users, many rights, 
very good for agile development, things like games, apps, right, mobile apps, because they are very empowering to the developer because these are schemas designed. The schema can basically come up as needed. Uh, okay. So the value pros and cons again. Uh, empowering the developer, and I put an asterisk on that one because you know that's not always a good thing. No offense to developers out there. Um, very scalable. Well, well governed developers can achieve miracles. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's got high availability, um, and it's economically viable because you're scaling out. You are. You can use a lot of economy, right, processors as opposed to scaling up and buying the bigger and the better. And, and let's be explicit there. You're talking specifically about parallelism. Absolutely. Yep. And and showing and auto shutting and all those fun things. Uh, and as an example, we have a Hadoop cluster here in the office. It's running a bunch of old laptops that we just scrounged from around. So uh, pretty interesting, really. And, and it's got quite good performance as well. Uh, the cons, it's really got some poor ad hoc query and analysis capabilities. Right? It's very difficult when you look at that document structure to say, find me all people who live in California. It is cool. Uh, you can index um, particular segments of the documents, but it can really be very, very complicated. Uh, there's a bit of a lack of maturity, and we're seeing that change. I think every day that goes by, more and more people are gaining expertise. You know, businesses are trying out. People are uh, gaining confidence at it. Uh, in many cases, it's eventually consistent. And without going too far into the concept of that, basically, if I write something and it immediately loads what I just wrote to, he may not see my change. And a great example of that might be like a Facebook comment, right? Where it doesn't need to be immediate. I post on Megan's Facebook wall, and she won't see it for five, six seconds. And that's okay. It's not mission critical. The, the eventual consistent gets into the difference between acid versus base. That's exactly and right. And yep. it's beyond what we're going to do here, but yeah. you need some keywords to look it up. That's yep. I started to go over that in this presentation, but I took it out just for time. Um, so here's a couple other NoSQL solutions. And again, I'm trying to be high level here. Uh, we have an RDF. Triple store. These are purpose built to store triples. And I put as an example something like Bob likes football. Um, they have a uh, query language that's specifically built for this called Sparkle, which is really fantastic. It's just got some amazing capabilities. Uh, it's one of the pillars of the semantic web, right? The idea that the web is this, well, that it's this massive, you know, unstructured data that, that if we harness and be able to query it really intelligently, right, it is limited power. I think it just read the right books and they think it's yeah, ready. And, and that's right. the key is to apply some of these techniques to it. That's right. So then we have a graph. It's a structure composed of uh, of nodes, edges, and properties. And you see it's actually pretty similar to a triple store. Um, and it's focused on the interconnection between entities. Uh, fast query to find associative data. Uh, this is something like you might see in a social network, um, right? Relationships between people and, and how you can traverse those relationships. So you might see you know, Stephen is a friend of Peter, who's a friend of Meg, find all the friends of Meg and find their friends of friends, right? It's easy to traverse that with this data structure as with something like a, a relational system. That might be really quite complicated. In terms of pulling all the joints together. Right? Especially if you have millions of records. Sorry, yep. made an error there. No worries. Yep. So now we are going to talk about column family and those of you who are most familiar with uh, relational third normal form, the best I had column family described to me when I was having a lot of trouble kind of wrapping my head around it is think of it like a view, right? If your actual data is a view where you've taken multiple tables together and combined them into a view, basically you can have unlimited columns on, on a row. And so columns are stored individually, but they're clustered by family. So as an example of that, you might see Peter, again, I like to use it as an example, and then you might see a column family of address, which is the columns, city, state, zip, and it has a column family of car, and we'll see the attributes for your car under that. And what that allows us to do is have unlimited uh, columns for any one record, but you can create only specific columns families and still pretty rich queries while excluding the other data. So we can basically have nearly unlimited numbers of columns without causing these expensive queries. Uh, pretty interesting stuff. Um, and so I just wanted to show you some examples here. Uh, there's an RDF triple stuff there, right? Subject, predicate, object, Bob likes hamburgers. And you've got a graph, kind of like what I was talking about, right? Uh, that dude is friends with that other dude, and that dude likes sushi. And place serves sushi. So all of these relationships and how they relate to each other. So you can see how you can traverse these questions 
really, uh, which is really interesting. You can find, you know, what friends of the dude with the beard like sushi, and you can traverse the graph uh, and find that out. Uh, down on the bottom left there, you'll see an example of the person table in a uh, column family. I think I pretty much went over that with Peter. Pretty interesting stuff. No know over all these, but I wanted to give you this in the slide deck if you're interested in those. There are a lot of technologies to check up there. And there's a whole lot of uh, variability, really. So there's just five minutes left. Let's talk about how all this is changing. Absolutely. The key of this is that we want you guys to understand there's lots and lots of starting points to come from. We use design patterns as ways of allowing people to understand this. And when people say, why should I investigate patterns, you can ask the question, have you ever noticed in large office buildings the restrooms generally are in the same place in every building? It's a visual clue and people know where to go, but in addition to that, it's also cheaper because if we put the infrastructure in one corner of the building, we don't need to run out. Certainly it would be cheaper to have a loo in everybody's office, but probably a little bit impractical. And of course, we just right. stop with the loo. We repeat that for electrical wiring, floor plans, et cetera, et cetera. Well, all these architectural patterns have different types of models and things. And I just wanted to point out here that did Marco, myself, David Hay, a lot of other people have written on these patterns in here. Some of them going as far in David Marco's book of including a disk with these patterns on them that you can get to directly into Erwin on this. So you have come up with some rules of thumb here that I found very, very useful. Yeah, that's right. I, I found these somewhere. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't remember where. I found it on some blog ages ago, and it really stuck with me. But they also come out true in what you see, though. I mean, that's right, absolutely. So we're finding that roughly a third of a data model contains fields common to all businesses. A third contains fields common to that industry. And a third is really specific to the organization. So I think that's pretty interesting, really, to, to kind of absorb. We'd love to get some empirical data on that. That'll require a different uh, webinar to go there. That's right. Uh, so patterns should theoretically provide an organization with a baseline to quickly develop data infrastructure. Are we seeing that practice? Sometimes there's a lot of ERP off-the-shelf solutions that certainly do meet that. Um, but theoretically, it should be easy now. There's so many people have done so many solutions out there. If only we could just harness that. Uh, off-the-shelf solutions may require in-depth customization, and in many cases, we see that off-the-shelf winds up being just as costly time or money as just building something from the ground up, and that's really a bit of a shame. But it's kind of like the outsourcing thing. Everybody went and outsourcing was going to solve all of our problems, and we discovered it didn't really solve all of them. So now we're back to where we're starting from. What's the right balance? And that's what right. we want you to take away from this. Yep. Now we'll talk about data as a service. Uh, this is based on the concept that data can be provided on demand to any user regardless of geographical or organizational separation. And I think a good example is what I was talking about earlier with the USPS data, right? Theoretically, you could get without really having uh, address tools defined. I mean, well, that's not entirely accurate, but, but basically you have something at your service or at your fingertips, a service that provides that exact data you're looking for. Um, so consequently, especially in schema list data, you can force what I've been calling a post schema on your data. But you shape the API. You can shape the way the data is fed or the way that it's subscribed to in a particular way to make it fit the molds that you need it to fit. And that can be as flexible or inflexible as, as necessary. So when you come up with a data logistics network, that actually gives us a topic we could do another entire webinar on just that one topic about being able to add schemas to things after piles of data have already been created. That's right. Uh, so adding structured information allows us to obtain exactly what we want, when we want it, and APIs allow applications to serve up data to external sources in a straight way. Again, this term post schema. Uh, we did talk quickly about scaling out, not up. I'm not going to cover this too quickly, but the idea right, right is that by, by um, having this distributed hash table, we can have our data housed in multiple locations, uh, multiple disparate locations, which means that you can scale out, not up. Again, I encourage you to do that if you want to read more about it since we are just about out of time here. I got that term auto sharding, which I'm going to be honest, I'm a grown man, but I always snicker when I hear that. That's okay, right? <laughs> so we're right around back at the top of the hour here again. What we've looked at is, is really the relationship between these things, the different models and different uses, and the fact that these things are changing. We've got a couple conclusions we want to finish with before we get to the Q&A section. That's right. And that one, which I know you've heard us hammer home, it's very important to get the modeling right. 
but you can't leave the explanation there. You've got to tell what the impact on the business is so that people understand. Again, in the example that we went into a little enough, they understood how much overtime they paid to staff that was working very, very hard. That's fine. We never actually got to what the impact on the business was on that. We were able to make it very clearly a local case. But, but for you all, you've got to be able to say to somebody, think of it like an elevator speech. We caught it last year. The reason was because the data model was wrong right? or whatever it is. Right, and go on. getting it right is hugely dependent on the business case, the maturity of the organization, the flexibility for future growth, and so much. One thing that I really want to touch on but we didn't get an opportunity to is really this NoSQL stuff to drive it home. A lot of that is very application-centric. It's really letting the application drive the data model right for better or for worse. And clearly there's so many technologies and ideas uh, out there now to solve a number of problems. And they're really solving very very specific problems and, and combine them all in, um, in very clever ways can really solve a huge variety of business problems. And your organizations are dependent on your expertise in order to help them solve those specific problems. Part of the thing, of course, we don't want you to model without understanding what the architecture is conceptually. If you don't have that conceptual framework, modeling can become an academic exercise or you can achieve a correct solution to an incorrect problem definition. That's right. So we're at the top of the hour here. Megan, we'll turn it back over to you, and let's see what sort of questions we have. I know we've got a bunch of them out there. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, guys. That was an awesome presentation. Now it's time for a Q&A. Uh, time for you all to ask your questions, so just click on the Q&A window feature at the top of your screen, and you should be able to submit your questions through that Q&A window. And at some point, I'll just give a few seconds for um, a few more to come on, so let's give a little bit of, little bit of time. I'll get started. And the first question is, how do you respond to developers who do not want to reuse corporate reference data codes and say it's easy to create an XML mapping file? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, I guess you can't whip them, right? <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. Uh, you know, that's a that's a tough one, and, and uh, I'm, I'm going to cut out a bit and say it really depends on, on the individual uh, application. But, you know, if you're really holding your organization to uh, informational excellence, I see no reason why they should not conform to what the rest of the organization is doing. Um, if there's a compelling business reason why they could use X mappings and, you know, kind of that themselves, then great. But if you've got great DBAs and, and, and day stewards and people, it, it could it could cause complication, um, and I realize that's a very generic response, but I'm willing to bet that that, that most organizations, particularly as they get to be larger organizations, are going to discover that economies of scale are going to be more and more important, and that while we'd be able to make a case for a local work group having a specific uh, set of things uh, on there, that that when you look globally across the enterprise, and even if you don't currently have a need. For it, it's probably pretty easy to forecast that there will eventually be one of those needs. That's right. Uh, that's one of the things that, that, that when Steve go into organizations, they'll be thinking, you know, look, here's our three-year plan. This is where we're going, and we'll be able to look ten years out and say, yep. And after your three-year plan, then you need another three-year plan, and by that point, you're actually starting to approach some of these enterprise applications. Now, the most important thing, though, is let's not devolve this question into a war about which side is right. Let's get the facts on the table so that we, in fact, look, how many XML transformations are we talking about? How often is this going to run? When you start to put those numbers on it and you realize that this query is going to run 8 billion times a day, right? okay, that's something we probably don't want to have running happen if we don't need it to run that often. Exactly right. Yeah, so again, I think the easy response to that is it really kind of depends. Right? But again, you all are the people who are closest to the ground who have access access to the facts and figures uh, on this. The more enjoyable parts about what we do with all this is that sometimes you guys will follow up with us with specific questions and we'll actually poke and prod and find out and come up with an answer uh, to that might actually be the not the intuitive one, that it's only going to happen four or five times and the rest of it's all pages and we don't have access to a lot of the internals. So yeah, let's make it a high level XML transformation under those circumstances because it seems to be the best answer for your group. That's right. Absolutely. But again, let's do it based on facts, not just based on a, a you know quasi, uh, um, let's say religion, but that's not the right analogy for it. I mean, uh, I come from a development background. I, I'm no offense to developers out there. I'm loath to let them make business decisions. <laughs> they don't let me make any 
any decisions that I was at the bell apps for sure. <laughs> All right, great. The next question is uh, difficulty in integrating data is the big challenge now in biomedical in the biomedical field. Can we address this problem at the stage of data modeling when designing a database with the owner of the data when the database doesn't realize the future integration problem? That's that's a good question and it's actually something that we quite a bit and just last week I was at a biomedical luncheon and I talked to someone extensively about how he's having these exact kinds of issues. Um to a fan who's talking to you. Yeah, maybe so if that's you, great, that was fantastic. Um yeah, so that's a great Great and a very difficult one to answer. I mean, what you're basically saying is you're not getting buy-in on getting the model designed directly up front. Is that right? Is that you said the? Can you the last half of the question there? Sure, let me get it. Sorry about that. that. No worries. Let me get it back up. Uh, how can we address this problem at the stage of data modeling when designing a database with the owner of the data when the owner of the database doesn't realize the feature of integration? Yeah. Okay. I thought I heard it. Right. Unfortunately, that sounds like it's uh, going to require some deft, maybe political maneuvering. I mean, that's really a business issue before it's even a data issue, I think, or at least it needs to be made a business issue. Uh, so maybe uh, the powers that be need to understand why this is important. And, and, and the key is to make sure that you present it to them in meaningful ways. That's right. So in other words, when I say meaningful, it, it's something that means something to the people in the corner office. So the corner office is concerned with sales then show them that the integration of this stuff will result in more sales and the lack of integration will be a barrier to improving your sales numbers. I don't think you're going to get sales out of biomedical, although you know there's certainly some parts of it. Maybe what it is is matches in disease or matches right. in genomic sequences. Right. Uh, lots of different things that have in there, but it, it's just incumbent on all of you all to say it's important and here's the business reason that it's important. Okay, the next question is, uh, given new platforms, what are the skill sets that a data modeler really needs today? And we haven't seen you out there for a while. <laughs> That's a great question, too. And I think at this point, right, we know the, the old standbys. I think fully understanding your, your standard relational systems is always going to do you uh, do right. And I think on into the future, I think there's plenty of systems that are just never going to be replaced uh, and never not going to be relational. I think at this point we're seeing these NoSQL technologies and these kind of you know emerging trends in data modeling, but they're so new. I, I feel like at this point I've kind of made the decision for myself. I'm really taking a breadth-first approach, really trying to just keep informed about all the different ones without really going down the rabbit hole of anything too far and seeing where that where that uh, lands. I mean, I'm thinking in five, six years we'll maybe see three or four major ones really coming to the front, and that's maybe when it's time to. Uh, attack it with more purpose. So one of the things I do when I'm looking at technology forecasting, which is part of what Audrey's question is, is relating to in here, is if you look back over the past five years in data modeling, we've probably seen more changes in the past five years than we saw for the 20 years before that. That's exactly right. So we are increasing the options, we're increasing the techniques, we're increasing the types of problems that we're adapting right. to. And that says we need to have people that can scale into these things because the college and university system is not putting out well-qualified data modelers that are immediately useful to the business. I'm not saying anything bad about what's going on in college and universities, but when you're dealing with toy problems as we deal with in the university, it's very different from walking in and you were working with something that had to do with the bone marrow sequencing That's right. uh, out there. Uh, you know, There's just no experience that you're going to get in college and universities that's going to prepare for that. Or, for example, for an organization that has the kind of volume that some of these organizations are dealing with. When you do a query literally billions of times, that's enough to make even a fraction of a second uh, a, a lot of difference that's in the organization right. adding out. Especially for, for the business case, right? And I think a part of saying is I think it's important to know about all the different tools out there so that you know that you're using the right tool for the right job rather than going to one of your old standbys. And I, I've really been relating this to sort of the, the code revolution, right? I mean, 20 years ago, there weren't that many programming languages. There's certainly not that many uh, paradigm shifts. I mean, uh, barring them, of course, a couple of examples. But now there's so many different languages and, and programming paradigms out there that it has led to increased specializ specialization and a little bit of fragmentation. I think we're going to see a little bit of the same thing uh, data modeling. Fair enough. Got it question. All right, next one is, could you go over the difference between a data warehouse and a data vault? Yeah, so briefly, right, a data warehouse 
stuff is sort of purpose built to have a single version of the truth, I think. Um, whereas I would say a data vault is more about capturing all the data all the time and being able to get to the truth. Uh, that's kind of a high level look. I, I'm not sure if you're looking for something more technical than that, but uh, that, that's kind of the way I always go into right? Because your data warehouse is going to be feeding your uh, individual data marts, and those are going to be asking very specific questions. So your data warehouse is going to be gathering very specific data. Your data vault is more about just give, give it all to me, and we'll figure we'll it out later. Like, give me all the data now, we'll let God sort it out later. So it's a high level description of those, too. Uh, question. Thank you for that. How do you address the performance issue where there is many-to-many -many relationships between entities? Well, that's kind of exactly what NoSQL is all about, I think, in many cases. Um, if you're, if you're, Which are two approaches. Yeah, sure. The first approach is a structured approach where you model it, come up with the intersecting entities, build a set of structures, and everything sits right there. But the second approach, and that presumes that you know most about what your data is. So if you know the answer is, you know exactly what your data it looks like you right. can build a solution relatively easy there. That's right. More often today, though, the data is not as well known, right. and the need for speed is, is pushing us into these other techniques, which is... That's right. And as I mentioned earlier, plenty of technologies are springing forth to try to address these needs. I mean, even things like materialized views and, and, and uh, I like that can, can help with this. Uh, certainly, that's, that's a problem that people deal with every single day, every day. So you can denormalize in some cases where it makes sense to denormalize. You beef up your infrastructure, which is a tough, you know, bitter to swallow. Uh, oh, the hardware vendors like it. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> yeah. All right. The question is, it says, schema in a document or key value data store is handled in the application. Where does logical modeling happen? That's a fantastic question. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure I, I have a great answer for that. It's most likely in the application package, it, it though. It will be probably at the application point. Um, I mean, it, it should be handled in some metadata surrounding the application, right? I mean, if, if you're doing it, it should be you should have metadata surrounding that so that uh, there should be some transparency, some buy-in. Realistically, though, it really is happening at the application level. And, and the problem with that is that when you're in a largely packages environment, your data model is the one thing that ties together all the application packages. So I'm switching to a different presentation right now just to, to show you all a slide that I had developed that addresses some of this. The key here is that what you see happen is that the, the reason they can get these software packages to work on a variety of databases is because they're using the database for just table handling, which means important functions like referential integrity are implemented in the software. First of all, it means you're underutilizing your database. And secondly, the people who develop the software implementations of the database functions are software developers. They tend not to be data people, so they do a good job, not a great job right. of doing that. And of course, then you ask the package to be customized, and the person who does that work is a consultant who is going to leave the organization after they're done, and you're left without a lot of the context that goes into that. So short piece on that. We'll remember to include that one slide in the rest of the presentation so everybody can get to that. Okay. Next is, uh, do you think data modeling will be used more in data virtualization than physical integration scenarios going forward? That's a great question. I wish I had a magic ball around that. Uh, I feel like, and maybe this is to purely anecdotal, and I realize saying anecdotal data to a bunch of data nerds is probably not the best approach. Oh, they love it. I used to hear all the time about data virtualization, and I personally haven't come across it much recently in my professional uh, career. Um, so I'm not sure that I can really answer that one. I don't know that. I tend to say yes, though, because the, yeah. the one thing that is happening out there is that they've now taken the data storage technologies and put them also on Moore's Law, mm -hmm. which means the sure. price of these things is going to go in half every two years, and the capacity is going to double. Mm -hmm. But if we can do that, it means we can do more with virtualization, so I'm just going to see more growth in that area, just based on that, that particular scenario. All right. Next question is, uh, most of the GIS data models are third S? Normal. Normal. We're All right. Data. All right. <laughs> but this data is used for viewing in a large scale by a viewing application. I guess more. Yeah, okay. follow up maybe to, to yeah. the question. Right, so I, I assume that's causing performance issues. Is that 
Is that what the same? Possibly. That could have yeah, so I can see that, right? You're taking this massive amount of data that's highly normalized. You're needing to join it all together, which is very expensive, and it's probably got some performance issues. I hope that's what you were saying. Yeah. Hardware vendors love it, right? Right. Yes. The next question is, how do you deal with DBA? We focus on performance. Who are resistant, resistant to normalized design, use of cascade constraints, foreign key. key, use of cascade deletes, etc. They think it's going to degrade performance. Is performance the only concern? I think uh, the answer to that is no. Performance is probably not the only concern, but it's the only concern for that business case. Which leads us to a, a, a webinar we did a couple months back on data strategy. So the key piece of that is what's your data strategy going to evolve? If your data right. strategy is focused on performance, as Stephen said, then absolutely everything right. else focuses on performance. And we know of a couple of organizations where that's really important, right. and we're really glad those organizations do that. It's yeah. probably not true for the majority of organizations. That's what I'm thinking, too. I mean, I, it, it's difficult to answer based on, you know, a, a variety of factors, but I think in general, well, it's hard to even put a general response to it, but again, very very specific, I think, to your individual issues uh, and, and the business case for it. But I would argue that, that the DBA, his job is to try to argue for that, but there needs to be something from the other end, right, saying it's not always about performance. It's great that you're there and you're an advocate for performance. That is important, but at the cost of what, right, at the cost of, uh, of having duplicate data or having or introducing poor data. Uh, if they can work for 10 of their buddies later on in the right. organization or, or exactly. a data cleanup organization right. that could become highly problematic. Right. Buy yourself a couple of extra milliseconds on your writes or your reads downstream if it's causing a lot of issues of, of um, integrating data to, to get some business insights, then it's definitely not worth it. On the other hand, if it's the difference between your customers using your application or not, then yeah, it probably is worth it. The next question is, uh, what is the difference between a data vault and data lake? So a data vault, Stephen, is described to you as a, a class of modeling um, techniques that you can use to put in place to do rather complicated evolving systems under circumstances where a data warehouse might not be the best approach. We're going to use the, word, the phrase data lake to talk about just the overall environment in the organization. Right. The data lake is the, the way we like It's typically a quality type of a process where people think of, I've got all this data in a data lake and I've got to go in and clean it up. Well, you know, if we're going to clean up the water in the lake, we probably have to find the source of the pollution because while it's a good idea to clean up the water in the lake, it's also a good idea to find the sources of the pollution and to eliminate them so we don't have to continue cleaning up the lake. Otherwise, it just becomes guaranteed work for somebody, and that's a wonderful thing, but, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, next question is, uh, what advice do you have for a recent college grad trying to break into the data modeling field? I mean, they have a degree in the IT field with uh, database management classes and data modeling classes. Networking, yeah. networking. Thing. It's all about networking, and, and you know, at, at this point, I think it's you really differentiate yourself, I think, by being able to speak kind of business's language. I think if you really focus on the IT side of things, that's great, and a lot of people with those skills, but you can really try to bridge the gap between that IT knowledge and, uh, and tie that back to a business case. I think that can be a, a big differentiator. I would also say it's unfortunate that you're a recent college grad because I would have taken your last course in college as an independent state and done a project for a company that you might want to go to work for uh, in order to do that. Um, then you, you may have some opportunities here. Uh, again, there's a number of conferences. We have uh, one of our favorites coming up is Enterprise Data World. It's going to be in Washington, D.C. If you're in the proximity of Washington, D.C. at the end of March, beginning of April, in addition to the cherry blossoms being wonderful, that time of year we're going to have about 1,000 data modeling people in one place at one point in time. It's a great place to network and learn about some of these additional sessions that are there. If you have trouble getting introductions, let us know. We know a bunch of different people. Oh, the next question is, imagine that there is a ERP implementation project. Therefore, there is no need for a physical model. Do we still need a modeling tool and effort if schemas and tables will be created by ERP tools themselves? So clearly the cart before the horse in this case. I would have hoped that the organization had done it this way. They would have a logical model of the business requirements that they wanted the ERP to solve, and they would look at the various ERP options 
I compare logical models of the ERPs to the model that they have and give you a very specific example on that that we ran into in the U.S. military. Uh, one of the primary entities in an HR system is that an employee can be related to a, pers to a position. And <clears throat> while that's an interesting, uh, uh, sorry, a person can be related to an employee, and, and most organizations implement that as a one-to-one -one relationship. In the military, many of the members and women of the armed forces have, have multiple jobs. So we have a requirement in the Defense Department that says that a person can be multiple employees. And looking for an ERP that has that multiple employees means we'll have to do less of workarounds, as Stephen was describing before, and are all lower total cost of ownership to everybody. So I want that modeling to be done to help select the package. Once you have the package, you are likely to be asking the vendor for those particular models. So the vendor will give you the models uh, in many cases, and you can use those models to help implement the integration as well as the data um, transfer, uh, data uh, uh, transformation from the old package to the new package as well. So the models, again, not modeling for modeling's sake, but what is the business problem we're trying to solve, and then can modeling be useful for it? And that's what we're trying to do. I think also just to follow up with that, we see so often people are jumping into tools to solve problems. And we think that really solving a tool should be further down the line. Uh, that may not necessarily be applicable in this particular case, but I think it, it, it bears repeating that we, you know, we come into organizations that have, well, we have all these different licenses for this tool and this tool, but we're still having these problems. And, well, you have to address root causes before you determine a tool. And Technology is one of the three legs we'd like people to stand on. The other are people in process. That's exactly right. My next question is, uh, what a consensus on reference tables. In that address table you showed earlier, you don't have you don't have state in a separate entity. For example, in my experience as a product table would be split and have a separate entity of product category. Yeah, I agree with that. And I, I think I mentioned that even kind of mid presentation. I think someone else uh, mentioned that. I agree. I think that table wasn't perfectly normalized. Um, I think reference integrity is hugely important and it's one of the massive benefits of going with a relational system. So I agree with you, uh, absolutely. You can have um, people managing that data, ensuring that those reference tables are up to date and that they accurately reflect these business concepts. So uh, in general, I am all for complete normalization when it makes sense and having absolutely everything in a managed reference table. Um, all we're doing today is talking about how there's some cases where that's not necessarily the right answer. Sure. Okay. Go ahead. Um, asking about uh, the consent between ER and triples. Please. The key there, of course, is that if you're understanding the way open data and linked data is working in the real world, almost everything is being stored out there as an EAV pair, uh, uh, triple, uh, attribute uh, relationship. Right, triple in there. And if, if you start to structure your data into that in general, you're able to use some of these techniques much more quickly. You don't have to restructure your data in order to get it into that environment. Uh, there's a, a couple of really, really good case studies that I could point you to um, that will talk specifically about much. But uh, one of my favorites is a colleague of mine up in uh, Fritchburg who had looked at a $30 million data warehouse that was being built for the federal government who was able to bring it in for $300,000. Mm. Those are the kind of numbers that people are going to pay attention to. Uh, great stuff. Um, and the next question is, wouldn't it be great to have a wiki containing all of the different models and schemas? If we could keep the vendors from suing us for putting their intellectual property out on the web, it would be a great idea. That's right. <laughs> there, there are collections of these things, and DEMA does, represent, uh, does maintain some of these. You'll see a lot of them we collected into our DIMBOC, uh, which is, uh, again, a certification that everybody on staff has here. Uh, in order to do that. Um, we do have to be careful, though. Uh, you certainly would be able to do that internal to your organization a lot easier than we can do it externally uh, because some of these things are, in fact, proprietary uh, organizations and they don't want them to be shared. Now, we're happy to sign NDAs and work within those constructs, but that also means we don't just take whatever they have and put it out on the web. That's uh, just rude behavior. Right. Okay, great. question is, uh, would you explain the differences between on family and tuple? Sure. Well, they're not huge and similar, other than the fact that they're really going to have a, a key to their ordered data. Um, the com family is really like, like a chart. If you can imagine it like a view, a 
operational. If you're thinking in third normal form, you're taking all these different tables and combining them into a view, right? That's really the main idea there, is that it's, it's a massive amount of data or not, but it can be a million different columns combined. Uh, with a tuple, I mean, really at, at, at its core, it is kind of a tuple already because it's got this key. And then as soon as you think of these column families and values around that. So I, I guess the real question is uh, performance-wise. And I, I tend to think of tuples as, uh, uh, I don't know, I mean, but so, chunk, yeah, it's really bite-sized, more ordered data. The, the key with column, though, is that it, they tend to be stored in memory. So the performance in columns tends to be fast, not necessarily because columns are a faster data structure, right. but because columns your databases tend to have a lot more RAM associated with them than the traditional databases. Yeah, that's definitely a point we didn't touch on, but sure. And um, somebody has been asking about um, having access to the slides after the session. Just to let you guys know, um, they will be emailed out to you two business days after the webinar. Um, some materials you have the recording. Um, any questions that were asked, they'll be um, those will be included as well. But it looks like that's all the questions we have for today. Um, thanks for all the wonderful questions, you guys. Thanks for an awesome presentation, uh, Stephen and Peter. Um, next month we'll have a webinar on metadata strategies, so hopefully you'll be able to join us for that as well. As always, feel free to contact us if you have any questions. And thanks again to Dataversity and Shannon for hosting us. Thanks everyone and have a great day. Thanks. Thank you.